looting of the Bentor residence of the slain president, William Richard Torbert. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. In addition to claims by the TRC accusing me of refusal to appear for public hearings, a claim I believe I have sufficiently dispelled, I will briefly dispel two other specific instances where the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Liberia and its members as an institution have been most irresponsible by publishing innuendos and outright, and outright lies about me in the conduct of this important national task. In the TRC publication of June 12, 2008, captioned, George Bolle looted Torbo's house in Bentor. Huge amount of cash and valuables taken away. This publication is most appalling to say the least. I mean, this was the headline of the TRC website. The single most development of the scheduled TRC hearings in St. Paul, Minnesota, in the United States. This was the testimony of a Kalango Luo, a Liberian, residing in the state of Minnesota during the TRC hearing in the United States in the city of St. Paul, Minnesota arranged by the same Hima Minnesota advocates that in November 2006 declared me guilty of human rights violations in Liberia. Mr. Chairman, fellow commissioners, the listening public, fellow Liberians, as much as I would prefer not to dignify these lies with a comment. I have a responsibility, I feel a responsibility to provide my children, my family, associates, and the world truthful information about these lies circulated to tarnish my reputation. TRC witness Captain Samuel Kalongo Duo <laughs> needs to be exposed for what he really is and his role in the alleged looting of President Torbo's Bento, Bento residence should be told. On the morning of April 12, Saturday morning, 1980, following my release from detention at the post arcade at the Barclay Training Center in Monrovia, BTC, I was brought to the executive mansion and assumed the duties of Minister of State. As the PRC was consolidating control, Romans circulated that a counter coup was being planned in Bento City by troops loyal to the late president. President Tower, that is. At the same time, credible sources informed that a Major William Jabo of the Armed Forces of Liberia was also effecting a counter coup. Based on available information and the credence attached to this, to this information, this 
pieces of information. Members of the PRC dispatched a team of soldiers to pursue Major William Dabo. Though I am not a professional soldier, I was instructed to proceed to Bento City to check out Romans of counter coup, to check out the Romans of the counter coup, supposedly by a troops lawyer to the late President Talbot. About half a dozen soldiers were ordered to accompany me to Bento. Captain Samuel Kalonko Luo was one of the soldiers ordered by PRC Commanding General Thomas Kuyongba to accompany me to Bento City. Kalonko Luo, before the coup, was an officer in the armed forces of Liberia. Since the coup was a non-commissioned officer affair, NCO, Captain Kalanko Luo's lifeline was PRC General Thomas Kuwamba, a fellow tribesman from Nima County. The late David Q. Nimle, also an officer in the AFL at the time of the coup, was designated by PRC Chairman Doe to accompany me to Bento. I suspected Kuwamba and Doe each had a reason for designating a representative each to accompany me to Bento City. Now, I know there are some smart people out there who are wondering why would, not, why would a non-military person like George Bowley be dispatched to Bento, a potential war zone, on the day of the coup? Members of the TRC, Mr. Chairman, I will attempt to offer an explanation never before revealed. I was instructed to proceed to Bento to ensure the safety of two elders of the leadership of Grand Gillette County about whom PRC Chairman Doe was concerned, namely Harry F. Nayo, Harry Faber Nayo, and Major Johnny Galley of the AFL. I knew both gentlemen. Mr. Nayu, a renowned educator in Zuadu, Grand Jida County, was at the time of the coup, principal of the Bensonville's Bento City School System, excuse me, while Major Johnny Galley, on the other hand, was commander of the Presidential Guard Unit of the Armed Forces of Liberia assigned to Bento City, home of the slain president. I proceeded directly to Bento from the executive mansion where we met a few arrived in Bento, where we met a few NCOs of the AFL in, in a celebratory mode and no sign of a counter coup. In Bento, I also found both Mr. Nayu and Major Gale in protective custody, detained by the NCOs but unharmed. I promptly ordered the release of both Mr. Nayu and Major Gale and, and Major Gale and arranged their transport to the relative safety of Monrovia. During the city of Benson, Bento, I observed the residence of the slain president was ransacked and vandalized. Leading the tour of the president's residence was Patrick Tuazema, butler to the slain president, whom we met at Bento. Okay. We had learned later on that the president had planned a trip out of the country. Captain Kalongo Luo, Captain David Q. Nimle, and five of the soldiers we met in Bento City joined me and the soldiers who accompanied me from Monrovia on a tour of the vandalized home of the slain president in the closet in the president's bedroom we found two leather briefcases one black one brown the brown briefcase had the initial WROT the black briefcase was unmarked 
The approximate dimension of the two briefcases was 3.5 inches by 18 inches by 13 inches. Gentlemen, ladies, the commission, you do the math and you will and you will know and you will appreciate the size of each of the brief cases. In the presence of Patrick Twazama, David Q. Nimlin, and the soldiers who accompanied me from the mansion, a certain mansion that is, I instructed Captain Samuel Kalonko Luo, General Kuyamba's destiny on the mission to take the two briefcases and bring them to the car in which he he being Samuel Kalango Lowe and I rode to Bento on Saturday morning, actually mid-afternoon, April 12, 1980. The briefcases were never opened, nor did I let them out of my sight. With Captain Kalango Luo riding in the same vehicle with me, we returned to the executive mansion where the PRC leadership, including General Thomas Kuramba, was awaiting the report from Bento. In the presence of the team of soldiers that accompanied me to Bento, including Captain Kalungo Luo, I delivered the two briefcases to PRC Chairman Do in the, in the palace of the executive mansion, unopened, just as we picked them up from the class. Ladies and gentlemen, I never heard of the issue of the assassinated president's briefcases until sometime in 2005, 25 years later, when Dr. Emmanuel Dolo called me from Minnesota. I was in Liberia at the time and mentioned, among other things, that Kalango Luo has circulated information in the Liberian community in Minnesota accusing me of taking money from President from late President Thomas grave. The President's grave, President Thomas tomb in Bensonville, at the family cemetery in Bento. I dismissed the accusation as ridiculous, as I did not believe President Thomas kept money in the cemetery. I, however, told Dr. Dolo the accusation was untrue and told him and proceeded to tell him of the two leather briefcases found in a closet at the, pre at the Australian president's uh, residence. Mr. Dolo, Dr. Emmanuel Dolo is alive and can, be, and can verify what I'm telling this commission and the general public. By June 2008, Captain Samuel Kalunko Luo's story had changed from taking the money from Torvald's grave at the family cemetery in Bensonville, pardon me, I keep getting this Bento confused. Bento, Bensonville are synonymous. Okay. From taking the money from Mr. Towers' grave to looting Towers' residence in Bento. So between 2005, when the war in Minnesota was that I took the money from the grave, about which Dr. Emmanuel Dolo contacted me. By 2008, June 12, when he conducted this, this he told the, the, your TRC meeting in Minnesota these lies. By 2008, June 12, they had changed from taking the money from Thomas tomb in the cemetery to looting Thomas residence. Captain Samuel, excuse me, according to the TRC witness, Colonel Kolo, I want to retract a little bit. In his June 12, 2008 tes testimony in St. Paul, Minnesota, according to Luo, PRC Chairman Doe's refusal to disclose the contents of the briefcases retrieved from the residence of the Syrian president to his colleagues, members of the PRC, was the cause of the conflict between PRC Chairman Doe and members of the PRC. Now, had I looted the late president's residence, should I not have kept the loot? I mean, you looked a kid. Captain Luo, Captain Kalanko Luo, five other soldiers, and I went to Bento on the orders of, of the PRC 
on April 12, 1980, on my instructions, Captain Kalongo Luo, in the presence of the team dispatched to Bento, retrieved two briefcases from the slain president's house, which were turned over to PRC by me, in the presence of members of the team dispatched to Bento by the, by the PRC, including Captain Kalongo Luo. How in the name of anything does this translate into looting of Torwood's residence by George Bole as published by the TRC? Mr. Chairman, members of the TRC fellow librarians, you know, I, I believe in always telling the truth about people who tell lies about me. In keeping with that principle, in keeping with that belief, I want to share with you some facts about your TRC witness, Samuel Kalonko Luo. Kalonko Luo is a notorious criminal who engaged in series of criminal activities including armed robbery, harassment of civilians, looting, and extortion in the immediate aftermath of the April 12, 1980 coup. Everyone in this country remembers, in the immediate aftermath of the military coup of 1980, criminals, sometimes posing as EFL soldiers, were going around extracting money from peaceful citizens and evicting citizens and residents from their lawfully acquired properties and homes. Captain Samuel Kalongo Luo was one of those criminals. He, however, regrettably, was an AFL soldier. One specific occasion in the immediate aftermath of the coup On one specific uh, occasion in the immediate aftermath of the coup, Captain Samuel Kalonko Luo led a band of criminals to the home of Mrs. Cravenel Parker at about 2 a.m. in the morning to evict her from her home. Dr. Peter Naigao, a respected colleague, summoned me that early morning to assist Mrs. Parker, I met Kalonko Luo at Mrs. Parker's residence and ordered his detention at the military at the Barclay Training Center BTC. Of course, AFL Commanding General Thomas Kuamba and Colonel John Noah, both of whom were Kalonko, Captain Kalonko Luo's lifeline, always found a reason to release this menace from detention. Mrs. Governor Parker, I understand, might not have known Captain Luo, Colin Cole Luo, but she and Dr. Niger, I believe, are still alive and can be contacted to verify the testament I make here today. Colin Cole Luo served as Assistant Minister of Agriculture in the PRC government. A customary liar. Captain Kalongo Luo fabricated stories of a coup plot in 1983 against the PRC, resulting to the execution of two of his compatriots from Nima County. Though many people have short memory, and others have no memory at all, there are people alive today who remember Kalongo Luo's confession of the fabricated coup plot on national television. I think everybody remembers here. Yeah. Uh, back in 83, uh, Kalongo Liu became so notorious. Whenever anyone uh, uh, is making a statement that even approximately has not been true, we all remember the used to say, Talk to Kalongo Liu, explain the Kalongo Liu. That was, that, that was a refrain. And that means tell me the lie. The people living today who remember that. In Liberia, Kalonko Luo's name is synonymous with lies and fabrication. This 
is the witness whose testimony accuses me of looting towards residence. As illogical as it may seem, was circulated around the globe worldwide by this Truth and Reconciliation Commission without due diligence. Charles Bayon incident. The death of Charles Bayon is another instance where a member of the TROC provided some misleading information. And all I can say about that members of the TROC is just to correct it right now for the record. You know, sometimes in life there are things you prefer not to talk about. Uh, in life there are things you prefer not to bring up to hurt people's feelings. Okay. And those decisions when made are taken out of context. So I will explain what I know about the child going. In fact, before I do that, not only was it mentioned in the letter to me from Mr. Quabo, there was a press release issued, perhaps a press conference given by the distinguished member of the council, the, the commission, Mrs. Pearl Bull, where she allegedly narrated what she thought was her memory of the child being incident. Members of the commission, I'd like to set the record straight. Before I do that, let me refresh your memory on what, what is attributed to Commissioner Bull from the, from the TRC publications. Commissioner Pearl Bull also narrated that Charles Bayon story, the Charles Bayon story, according to what she could remember, Bayon did not see President Doe because, uh, uh, Bayon did see President Doe because from, former Foreign Minister Dr. T. Anis Eastman saw Bayon in handcuffs. Bayon pleaded with Eastman to plead for Doe on his behalf, but Eastman did not do so. After Eastman left, Charles was called in to see Doe, and several calls were made to George Bowley, who was close to the president and had a baby by Bayon's sister. But he did not come, but kept saying, all was okay to the Bayon sisters. Excuse me. But after Bayon was killed and Bole was asked, he said, and I quote, the killing of Charles Bayon was part of the revolution. I want Bole to substantiate this if he comes before this, this TRC because we have written him. Front page Africa. October 30, 2008. Accessed November 1st, 2008. On reading this, I checked with the front page, with the editor of front page, and was told the newspaper stands by its report. Uh, members of the TRC, um, as I said, I have a responsibility to address this issue. I would like to clear for the record, maybe uh, uh, provide the information that the Honorable Commissioner might not have had when she had this press interview, which also circulated all around the world. Oh, yeah, it's true. Charles Brion's sister has a, a baby for me. I mean, can you imagine? And I'm saying that his death was part of the revolution. Amen. Even a hapless person, I don't think would have done that. But for the record, let me set the record straight. And what I'm going to try to do is to tell you what I did do about the child being incident. When, when I did it, 
when I heard about Charles' death and how I heard about it for the record. On Tuesday, November 12, 1985, after the Kuyongba led invasion was repelled, I was driving towards Sinker in a red Toyota Jeep. The shooting had subsided in my neighborhood, the ERW area, where the fighting had been intense at the government owned ERBC radio station in Painesville. Approaching the Congo Town Police Depot, Across from the old German embassy in Sinker, I saw sitting on the ground on the sidewalk of Tottenham Boulevard someone whom I recognized as Charles Bayon and another employee of ULBC. The two were being guarded, or the two were guarded by three AFL soldiers. As I drove, as I slowed down, one of the soldiers approached the Jeep and said, pointing at Charles Bayon, Chief, this man came to the mansion this morning with the rebels. He was taking pictures. So I got down from the jeep. I descended the jeep. Taking precaution from possible sniper fire, I asked the young officer, who was a lieutenant, if anyone saw Mr. Charles Bayon with arms. The officer replied, no, sir. But he came with the rebels. He had a TV camera taking pictures at the mansion. I told the officers that journalists are people who report news, news, news stories, and that we all know Charles Bayon to be a journalist. And because he was at the mansion grounds with the rebels and a TV camera, does not mean he's a rebel. The soldiers obviously were upset considering that they had been at battle with rebel forces rebel national patriotic forces a few hours earlier they were unhappy they actually attempted to refuse my orders but i'm commissioned in the armed forces of liberia as a major and really with my rank as a major in the afl I ordered the junior officers to release the two men immediately into my custody. They did. I instructed the junior officers riding with me. Incidentally, there were two officers riding with me that afternoon in the jeep. So in addition to me, I had two soldiers in the jeep with me. There were three soldiers guarding Charles Brown and the other guy. So there were five soldiers on the scene, five Air Force soldiers. Okay? Two were riding with me. The two that were riding with me, I instructed them to take Mr. Bayon and the other ERBC employees and put them in my Jeep, the red Toyota Jeep. In the wake of the uncertainty in Liberia, in Monrovia, I drove towards central Monrovia and drove both Charles Bayon and the other ERBC employees to their respective homes. I drove Charles Bayon to the home of his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence Bayon, Omer Lawrence Bayon and Mrs. L.V. Bayon, in Say Town, across the bridge on Bushwa Island. This was on Tuesday, November 12, in the heat of the, of the tension in Monrovia, November 12, 1985, the day of the failed Kuyomba coup in Monrovia. I delivered Charles Bayon to his mother, Mrs. L. B. Bayon, alive. I, re I repeat, <laughs> I delivered Charles Bayon to his mother, alive. I told Mrs. L. B. Bayon to make sure Charles Bayon does not leave the house until I, until I say it was safe for him to do so. I further said, and I quote, if anybody comes here, looking for Charles, please call me. I did not take Mr. Bayon to his wife and son where they lived because I was not sure once I left what the two soldiers would tell the other soldiers to come looking for him. So I drove him to the home of his mother and his father where my daughter was. The one 
the distinguished commissioner referred to as <laughs> that's true I took him to where my own daughter was to make sure that he was protected I advised Mrs. L.B. Bayon Charles's mother make sure please make sure Charles does not leave this house until I say so and my parting was to Charles Bayon himself as I left his mother's house where and I quote and really this was my last word to him do not leave this house until you hear from me these were my exact words to Charles Bayon as I left his parents home on Tuesday November 12 1985 for several days thereafter Liberia especially Monrovia was tense while General Thomas Kuhamba and his retreating national patriotic forces remain at large. On Friday, November 15, 1985, General Kuyongba was captured and killed. On Friday, November 15. On Saturday morning, November 16, 1985, after the capture of General Kuyongba, President Doe, until the capture of General Kuyongba, confined himself to the executive mansion who confined himself to the executive mansion decided to tour the ELBC radio station and TV station site of the fiercest battle between government and rebel detractor forces is it clear? from the time the Kuomba invasion occurred they would never left the mansion until Saturday morning uh, November 16th Kuomba was captured on November 15th. That Saturday morning, Doe decided to go to the railway station to see the damage that was done to the, to the facility. I learned later that Saturday afternoon, November 16, 1985, at about 5 p.m., from Charles Bayon's sister, mother of one of my children, that Charles Bayon was arrested earlier in the day at the ELBC radio station during President Doe's tour of the facility and killed. Until his sister told me what happened, no member of the Bayon family ever contacted me despite my advice to Charles Bayon himself and his mother four days earlier on Tuesday, November 12, 1985, not to venture out of the house without first hearing from me. I repeat, from the day I delivered Charles Bayon's living body to his mother, Mrs. L. V. Bayon, at the home of his parents in Seytown, Bushra Island, on Tuesday, November 12, 1985, and strongly cautioned Charles Bayon and his mother and his parents that they should not allow him to leave the house until I say it was safe for him to do so no one ever contacted me the first the first time i ever heard Charles had been in trouble was at 5 p.m saturday afternoon saturday evening november 16 1985. mr chairman members of the trc as i said i wanted to make this explanation it's very important you know when there's commission that is that people consider all around the world whatever they say people believe you i mean hey man when when when, when you say the type of thing that i believe the commissioner said inadvertently it needs to be corrected because you know uh, maybe you're misinformed you know rumors circulate and 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 i think you should be guided be certain of your facts. I, I don't want to say this to you, it's certain me, but, but you know, it, 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 just, it just seems that way to me. How could I have said the things attributed to me? But I guess, and I will dismiss that as just misinformation. I've given you my side of this story, and for the record, I will now move on. on there are several instances that I could go, but you know, in the interest of time, and as I said, bear with me my life is on the line here this is my last opportunity to let you know irrespective of what you decide 
what the troops are. But the truth is, because in the end, truth comes to the ground, shall rise. Historical antecedents. I understand and appreciate the need to request Liberians to review the state of the Liberian state with reference to events between 1979 through 2003. The ills and challenges of Liberia are as old as this country. A distressfully ill-conceived nation, Liberia seemingly incurable in illnesses pre 1979. The culture of injustice, dishonesty, ignorance, lies, reckless and deliberate dissemination of unsubstantiated rumors, innuendos, petty gossips, and jealousies are all ills symptomatic of a terminally ill society. A number of persons who have appeared before the TRC, including Liberians and non-Liberians, suggested, based on their knowledge of events in Liberia, that Liberia is terminally ill, perhaps beyond recuperation. Others have suggested a dismantling of the Liberian state, perhaps metaphorically. These observations should be a wake-up call to all in this day and age, for the telling signs of dome have long been posted by both Liberians and non-Liberians. As a child and young man and young adolescent, Growing up in rural Liberia, I had the privilege of being raised, taught, and trained by my paternal grandfather, Chief Bully. Grandpa Bully, actually, had no formal education, but his knowledge of events in this Liberia was, re was remarkable. My grandfather provided me information about events in which events which impacted our family and other families in so profound a manner that as I grew up and learned more about Liberia, I found that the incidents and situations of which my grandfather told me affected not just our family, these events, these events affected the entire country. Incidents and situations we would today describe as historical antecedents of our national ill. Chief Bole, as Grandpa was affectionately called, told me of a brother, my grand uncle, traveling in the interior of Maryland County, down the coast they call it in those days, in southeastern Liberia, who was kidnapped and forcibly shipped to Fernando Po, present day Equatorial Guinea, a Spanish cocoa plantation island of the Atlantic coast. He described with clarity and exactitude the circumstances of the kidnapping of his brother by soldiers of the Liberia Frontier Force, LFF, on the orders of a district commissioner, a DC, a Gola man named Tani Johnson, assigned to Maryland County by President Charles Doma King. The forced labor recruitment and shipment into slavery of the native population of Liberia as late as the 1930s by the government of Liberia during the administration of President Charles Dunbar Budgets King is common knowledge. President King and his Vice President Yancey were forced to resign in 1930 over the issue of slavery in Liberia and the forced recruitment and shipment of Liberians as laborers to Fernando Po and other parts of the world. J.C. Johnson, Thomas E. Pelham, Robert W. Draper, E.G.W. King, N.A. Bracewell, and C. Cooper were labor recruiting agents in the 1928 Fernando Po Agreement. These are people recruiting our people, sending them into slavery, into Fernando Po. Yeah in Liberia in, 19, in, in the 1920s and 30s. The international community, the League of Nations at the time, based in The Hague, not Liberians, 
follows President King's resignation. This is the same Hague where another Liberian president, Charles Taylor, though under different circumstances, is being tried for war crimes allegedly committed in Sierra Leone. Not Liberia, 70 years later. Today, Liberia is once more at the mercy of the so-called international community. This time, the United Nations, a much larger but weaker, indecisive and unwieldy conglomeration of states whose individual national interests often supersede the collective interests of humanity. District Commissioner Connie Johnson, my grandfather remembered, was a good man who initially told the chiefs and elders of the towns and villages in the interior to refuse the government's demand to send their young people to Fernando Po into slavery, into forced labor. Nearly 80 years later, I found my grandfather's version of the kidnapping of his brother at Crowakin, Maryland County, and his description of District Commissioner Connie Johnson's role in the systematic abuse of our people, violation of their civil liberties and humiliation, corroborated by yet another Johnson. Charles Spongeon Johnson, an American, appointed by United States President Herbert Hoover to represent the government of the United States of America on the International Commission of Inquiry into the existence of slavery and forced labor in the Republic of Liberia. Chief Bole never knew or met Dr. Charles Spongeon Johnson. That Dr. Johnson's documented account corroborated Chief Bowley's narrative of that period makes this compelling story, makes this a compelling story to recount, especially in reference to the historical antecedents of Liberia's present predicament. Now, one may want to know who was Charles Spongeon Johnson? Charles Spencer Johnson was a person of Negro descent, a black American, an African American, to use today's politically correct terminology. Charles Spencer Johnson studied sociology at Virginia Union University and the University of Chicago. At the time of his appointment by President Hoover to the International Commission of Inquiry into the existence of slavery and forced labor in the Republic of Liberia. Dr. Johnson was head of the Department of Sociology at Fisk University in the city of Tennessee, in the state of Tennessee, in the city of Nashville, the state of Tennessee, in the United States. After his seven month tour of duty in Liberia, Dr. Johnson returned to the United States thoroughly ached by what he saw in Liberia. He wrote a book, the title of the book, Bitter Kennan. It took him 20 years to write this book, but he could not get the book published at the, same at, at the time for the same reason that anything that had to do with Liberia at that time and to some extent today never really got the attention from America, Europe, or anywhere else for that matter unless, of course, the national interest of the foreign country was at stake. Dr. Charles Spongeon Johnson died in 1956, angry, very angry, about what he saw and heard in Liberia 26 years earlier. In 1987, nearly 40 years after Bitter Kennan was written, and 31 years after his, after his death, Dr. Johnson's book was finally published. In the preface to Peter Kennan, John H. Stanfield II wrote of Dr. Charles Spongeon Johnson, quotation, when, Ch when Commissioner Johnson returned to the United States from his seven-month-long assignment in Liberia, which lasted from March 
to September 1930, he was deeply disturbed. He was thoroughly disgusted with what he saw and heard in what was supposed to be the canon land of the black presence on planet Earth. The prime model bastion of black self-rule. Johnson was appalled at how the Liberian elite, the American Liberians, who were dis descendants of Afro-Americans, who immigrated from a white America, exploited, generally mistreated the native population. The means through which American Liberians, the neighboring imperialistic European colonial powers, and the United States as reluctant guardian of the nation state handle Liberia's development problem did not sit comfortably with him, end of quote. Dr. Johnson meticulously recorded accounts of the events of this dark period in Liberia's history. One of many dark periods of Liberia's checkered existence. I found in Dr. Johnson's book confirmation of the narrative of my grandfather regarding the predatory raids by soldiers of the Liberia Frontier Force ordered by District Commissioner Connie Johnson for the purpose of capturing men for shipment to Finanopo against their will. My granduncle was a victim of this particular predatory raid and forcibly shipped to Finanopo. Now, members of the Commission, uh, when you do genealogy, most of you are academics and scholars, you know the excitement that comes with finding out something, I mean directly, that, that affects you, can be exhilarating. And in that, in that line, I was excited to stumble on particular events that affected directly members of my family. And I, and I suspect many other families, which indeed form the antecedents to our historical uh, 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 situation. Dr. Johnson wrote, The mysterious orders under which these raids were being conducted in the interior of southern Liberia appeared in the case of Chief Yomi of Koroki and the District Commissioner Kani Johnson. This commissioner, a native Gola, was a Gola man, educated in Monrovia, a young man of frank, open personality, who in his frankness had admitted administrative irregularities. When first placed in the district, Johnson had advised the chief, as my grandfather related, to resist the demands of Vice President Yancey for laborers. Suddenly, however, he reversed his policy, his decision, and became brutal in his efforts to force the chiefs to produce more men for shipment to Fernando Po. A demand was made at one point for more men than the local community could afford. And the chief made that known to Commissioner Johnson. Infuriated, the chief ordered the commissioner detained in, in the guardhouse, in the confinement house. Until the required number of men were recruited. On the base, while the chiefs were being detained, the commissioner dispatched the soldiers to the villages on what was called a predatory raid to forcibly recruit any number of men for shipment to Finanopo. This is the conversation that transpired between the chief and Commissioner Kani Johnson. Chief, is it possible for us to leave our wives and children to go to Finanopo? Finanopo is not a very good place to be. People die there frequently. If you want us to walk on the road or at Firestone, we will go, but not to Finanopo. Commissioner Johnson. But you have to go to Finanopo. You did not give young men, therefore you will go to Finanopo, the chief. Let us go and see if we can catch our young men. But Finanopo is a place 
where men die all the time. We do not want to go. Commissioner Johnson. If you all do not want to go, then the chief of every town must stay until men are found. So the chiefs will return to the guardhouse and the, the younger or the the elder men were sent to recruit men. The women who had been arrested earlier, they, their leaders were sent to Nyakin to meet the chief to explain to them what had happened, what was happening with them. The women informed the old men, since you left us yesterday, they put us all in a small house, and if you want to go to the call of nature, you were held, you had to be held by soldiers. So the chief turned to the, to the soldier. Let the woman go. The soldier says, No, the DC's order must be obeyed. So the chief returned to Commissioner Johnson. I go back for men and see how soldiers treat our women. Commissioner Johnson. Well, if you don't want to go to Fernando Po, you will be treated so. Tell the woman to go get their husbands from the bush or they will go to Fernando Po. The woman. All right, we will go if our husbands say so. When the soldiers went into the town to get the woman, all of them ran. One woman who ran fell in the ditch and broke her leg. The next morning, the chiefs carried to the barracks to Commissioner Connie Johnson 30, 30 men. And this is what the chief said. These boys you want to send to Fernando Po. Will we get something from them? Commissioner Johnson. It is none of your business. And it is not mine to tell you. They are going for four to six months. After six months, the men were not returned, and the chief returned to Commissioner Johnson. Where are the boys? DC Johnson. I will write Nyasi, and what he says, I will tell you. When confronted by international community of, in of inquiry, District Commissioner Connie Johnson confirmed these exchanges and told the commission he had a change of heart after Vice President Yancey personally delivered a letter to him from President King. District Commissioner Connie Johnson did not give that letter uh, from President King to the commission. Instead, he gave the commission a letter which Yancey, Vice President Yancey had written him personally. And the letter reads, This letter comes to advise you that I arrived in Cape Palmas on last week Wednesday and in, and in leaving Monrovia, the president handed me a letter bearing your address and of which he asked me to tender you in person and not by proxy. In view of this fact, I shall be pleased to have you come to Harper at, er at an early date and thereby take delivery of sin. All of these are quoted from Johnson's 1987 Peter Ken, which is 185 to 186. In addition to these predatory raids for laborers to build public roads, workers for the newly established Firestone rubber plantation, the government, as you know, provided laborers for Firestone when Firestone was founded in 1926 and men to ship into slave labor into Fernando Po, military incursions were ordered by President King into southeastern Liberia, into Putu in the 1920s, remembered as the Putu War, in a bid to extend the authority of the Monrovia-based central government over the inhabitants of the interior. As a direct result of these unprovoked military incursions, my family and many others and many other families were displaced. Two of my uncles were kidnapped by government soldiers and used as potters. They never returned to Putu. One uncle settled in Gio country, inbound to be exact, which in 1964 became part of Nima County. While the others settled in Pele country, <laughs> in San Jose, now part of Bon County. And until his death in November 1974, my grandfather, Chief Bowley, 
never saw his brother who was shipped to Fernando Po. Neither did he get to know his two sons kidnapped by government troops to perform proper duties. These are historical antecedents of the heroes of Liberia. My generation, my father's generation, my children's generation never got to know family members, as I'm sure many of our families kidnapped and ordered on orders of District Commissioner Canning Johnson and forcibly shipped into slave labor, slave labor into Fernando Po. In this revelation, as a matter of fact, it's not about guilt tripping. It is not about seeking sympathy from anyone, nor is it about stepping, step, sidestepping the issues at hand. Indeed, this is the issue at hand. It is this type of conduct that is responsible for the issue at hand. This revelation is about reality checking Liberia. These are things that happened in Liberia that affected real people, some of whom are still around today, people whose offspring are alive and are living with the consequences of the inhumane treatment meted out to their, to their parents and relatives by public officials. This, this revelation is about the true historical antecedents of our dangerously ill nation. There are many families in Liberia, in Liberia with similar experiences or worse. Today, <laughs> members of the TRC, fellow Liberians, we have a very unique opportunity, given the benefit of hindsight for the offsprings of the oppressors, the self-styled elite of the Liberian society, the so-called American Liberians, and oppressed the so-called indigenous or country people, the Congo country divide, for lack of a better phrase, to bridge the divide, rebuild a nation, vibrant and inclusive society. Today, for example, Mrs. Olobenki King Akireli, granddaughter of President Charles Domba Burgess King, the president whose administration is characterized by the worst form of oppression and abuse of the native population of Liberia. It's for Minnesota, Liberia. And the granddaughter and the grandchildren and great grandchildren of District Commissioner Kenny Johnson are in positions of leadership in both public and private sectors in Liberia. We have an opportunity to reconcile the past. Most importantly, we must acknowledge that not only is our present does our present adversely impacted by our past, our present is the consequence of our past. Please. 1979. Just before you continue, uh, Mr. Witness, please, I beg your indulgence to just. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, however, we appreciate the comments of the witness. Please, we do not prefer comments from your end. No jeering, no booing, and no cheering. Please. Please continue, sir. Thank you. Pre-1979 warnings. As previously stated, the warning signs of pending calamity in Liberia were posted nearly two decades after Dr. Charles Spongeon Johnson's disturbing visit to Liberia in 1930. Another American author, Raymond Leslie Beale, in the preface to his book, Liberia, a Century of Survival, published 1947 in commemoration of Liberia's centennial anniversary, noted. I have written this little book, this little centennial volume on Liberia in the hope that the next century will be happier. We are entering into a tough world in which the colored people will demand forcibly rights which they have hitherto not enjoyed. These rights should be granted to Liberia as well, unless something radical is done to narrow the gap between the governing oligarchy and the Liberian people. It is not impossible that within 25 years, fighting in Liberia will break out. This was 1947. 
written by an American. Mr. Burroughs conclu concluded that fighting in Liberia had not begun because of the presence of, Ameri of American troops in Liberia. Why Bill's warning was in relation to various issues of discrimination and segregation based on skin color in America, his observation about Liberia was prophetic. The events of the previous century were clear indicators of pending doom in Liberia. Every Liberian family, be it of the governor oligarchy or the so-called indigenous Liberian, has been adversely impacted and victimized as a consequence of our collective national attitude of indifference. The indicators and events referenced by Mr. Bill during Liberia's first century of statehood are common knowledge to Liberians and students of Liberia of Liberian affairs, except, of course, regrettably, for the present generation of Liberians who, as a result of the war prophesied by Mr. Boone, never attained any form of education and are therefore less educated than their parents. A culture of lies. Mr. Chairman, members of the TRC, despite the less than desirable experiences of the last century and a half, Liberia continues to sink ever rapidly to new lows. The culture of dishonesty and lies circulated. Circulation, the circulation of unsubstantiated romance and deliberate disinformation of self-serving disinformation is fast destroying this nation. National figures and supposed intellectuals seem incapable of shaking off the culture of lies and circulation of self-serving disinformation. These vices are more destructive than bullets. The self-destruction from which we now, we Liberians, we Liberians now try to ex extricate ourselves was fueled largely by lies circulated domestically and internationally to the delight of individuals and nations seeking surrogates to do their bidding. It is said to be believable, a lie has to be big enough and told by a person or persons of an institution or institution of equally important stature. A few examples from experience, personal experience might suffice. You know, for the last four decades, uh, things, lies that have been circulated about us, disinformation, have impacted us in so many ways. In fact, in so negative fashion that it's become part of the culture of this country. It's important, very important. And again, for someone like me, who stands accused by this commission and others around the globe, this might very well be my only opportunity to just give you a little, tell you exactly a little bit about my own experiences, who I am, so that people stop making up stories about who George Bowley is. That's important. The self-destruction from which we now try to extricate ourselves, as I said previously, was filled, large, was filled largely by the circulation of this information. In my own case, sometime after the 1979 rights riots, lies circulated in Monrovia that I was read by then President William R. Talbot and his wife, Mrs. Victoria Talbot, a privileged country boy, a, be a, a beneficiary of elitism and the privileged class in a Liberian society. Interesting. Two now deceased cabinet ministers of the Togo government claimed this information got around in the immediate aftermath of the April 14, 1979 rights riot at one of the cabinet meetings. Not only did I discount the expression, I assured the curious ministers there was not an outer of truth to this fabrication and that perhaps 
the purveyor of this slander could only be indulging in self-adulation. In the wake of the April 12, 1980 coup, this big lie resurfaced. This time, with such venom that it not only almost cost my life, but near but gravely affected for some time the conduct and operation of the PRC government in the immediate aftermath of the 1980 military coup d'etat, an example of the destructiveness of negative and negative impact of lies, or of a lie in this case. Almost three decades later, to my greatest astonishment, I will read in a book title, Lift It Up, the Victoria Tower Story, written by Victoria Anna David Tobert, in which one who in which will be considered the book itself will be considered this is uh, uh, an autobiography it's an autobiography in this book mrs Tobert shamelessly wrote and i quote two members of those cabinets dr kate bryant and dr george Bowley, came to visit me on behalf of their colleagues they presented me a birthday gift of $500. Dr. George Bowley was read by my husband and me, and we facilitated his education. In our time of trouble, he completely turned his back on us. That's in page 165 of the book title, Lifted Up. The Victoria Tower story. No lie, ladies and gentlemen, could be bigger, <laughs> could be could be bigger, nor told by anyone supposedly bigger. Either Mrs. Victoria Tower, now deceased, deceased, had taken leave of her senses, or she was claiming credit for someone she never knew. This kind of insanity by supposed leaders in the Liberian society is responsible in no small way, in no small measure, for where Liberia finds itself today. On both counts of Mrs. Torbert's claim, which of these are not true, I'd like to offer the following comments. Nothing could be further from the truth. Born in Putu, at the foot of the Jira Range in southeastern Liberia, I grew up in Zwedro, attended a Catholic elementary school known as Central Eminem School run by a Catholic missionary as a boarding student until 1979. I started Central Eminem in third grade, in fact, actually in second grade, until 1967. I matriculated, as you say, to the Race Institute in Virginia, sponsored not by Vice, then Vice President Turbo and Mrs. Victoria Turbo, but by my father, Henry H. Bole, a lowly public servant in rural Liberia. During the three years I stayed at Riggs Institute, I saw Mrs. Victoria Talbot from a distance, fewer than three times, how she would claim to have read me and facilitated my education is beyond me. And by the way, please bear with me, because as I said in this country, People know about everybody else but themselves. For nearly 42 years, from 1967 until now, that's 42 years, four decades of my life, I've been living in the shadows. It's been going all around. Go see me. A man that told us song. A man that I told us rain. Told us this and that. I don't know where the stories came from. But, you know, we learned to live with that. In fact, initially, I decided once it was now written, I wouldn't address ghetto talk or gossips. Okay. But once it ended up in writing, then you have to address it. These lies have impacted my life. You know, I, I, look, I decided, well, okay, maybe the just talk. But when my children begin to ask questions, Dad, because you know, I've always told my children, there's always the only place I know in the world where success comes before works is in the dictionary. And I've always told my kids, work hard, labor hard, 
and you'll make it. Don't depend on anybody. You'll make it. When my daughter finds in the library a book that says, Will it talk about raised me? And she comes to me and says, Dad, so you are a beneficiary of the elitist system. I mean, I owe my daughter an explanation. And, you know, I, I, I say that it's an opportunity. Maybe it's a timely opportunity. And so bear with me. Because we will, you know, we will put these things into order. As I said, you may never hear from me again. This is my opportunity to tell you who I am. How I got to where I am. So that today I've become, oh, this, this George Bush. I mean, just go on Google. Put in George Bullet. There's more things written about me than, than practically everybody in RL. It's interesting. For a man who was born uh, in, in, in rural Liberia, all of a sudden, everybody knows George Bowler. Everybody is responsible for his success, if we may call it that. And so, I need to put this to rest. Last night, I had a, my brother came to me. I said, brother, you got to put this to rest. People had uh, pushed him around this town. Uh, I talk about race of brother, and he turned on the family. Hey, man. I, I, where did this guy come from? So we're going to put that to rest today, here. At least that'll be one less thing. I'll follow me. You know, that'll be one less thing that I'm going to take off my bike today. Now, about her claim that I turned my back completely on a troubled family in a time of trouble, again, not only is this untrue, this type of attitude is the epitome of ingratitude, the kind of contemptuous, self, selfish, and, and disrespectful attitude toward others that led Liberia down this present path. And it's important that these things are said because this is the type of behavior that got us to where we are today. I can only say for the record, for now, that I did for Mrs. Torber and her family officially and unofficially what very few people would have would have risked at the time to secure her release from further detention after the coup of 1980 to subsequently leave liberia supposedly for medical treatment mrs turbo may have read many liberians and facilitated the education george bowley certainly most certainly was not one of them I went to Richmond until 1967, in the 10th grade. My father paid my tuition, as I said. I had no idea where even Vice President Tarver lived. I only, when he came on campus on Ricks, he said, VP come and I said, yeah, who got that, that 05, that VP inside? Ask everybody in this country. When I used to come from Ricks Institute to go to Zwedro for vacation when the school closed, I used to sleep on PHP Beach. The person who had come and they told me some place to stay was a family called the Peter Coleman. Dr. Peter Coleman Jr.'s dad was married at the time to the lady called now called Fanny Duba, new or Fanny Mason, Du Mason's sister. I would come from Ricks, they would give me some place to sleep at their home in PHP on the beach. If I get a car, I could have it. They used to cost five dollars in those days. That's how I went to Race Institute. I never got a Baptist scholarship. I never got a, a, a scholarship from the Baptist Convention, the Liberian Baptist Convention, nor did I get a scholarship from the Torah. I never once saw Mrs. Torah. I saw, as I said, only three times more distance on race. They will come, uh, Mr. Alberto Sob was then chairman of the Baptist Convention. They will come to the Liberian Baptist Women Convention. And, you know, we, were, we, we just saw these people from a distance. When I graduated high school, 1969, December 2nd, the first job I had in Liberia was a job of a posting clerk. I took a test to work at the Bengal Liberia. The man called Chuchu Francis Hockney is here. Arthur Hickson was then vice president. Romeo Hockney is dead now, but asked those people, they're living. I took a test. And my first professional job was a posting clerk because at Ritz Institute we did vocational things in addition to, to academics. At the bookkeeping. I was hired by the Bengal Library. That was my professional job. I worked at that job. I was paid $75 a month. That's more money than most people made in those days. 
That's big money. In addition to that, I was a night school teacher. I taught at the school run by Omer Kenene Wulu. Okay. This uh, 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 minister of Wulu's or, or, or dad he was the principal of the school. Omer John Kenene Wulu. Which is next in high school. Really on, 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 on in Basa community. I worked there at night as a school teacher. I made extra $25. I made $100 a month. I'm getting money. I saved that money. And between, and by, by September 8, 1970, okay, I was able to acquire a plane ticket to travel to the United States, where the State University of New York in those days offered what they call foreign student tuition waiver. I benefited from that. And, and attended the State University of New York, where I did a bachelor's degree in political science. Not supported by the towers or anyone else. I entered the United States of America with $4.50 in my pocket. I was met at JFK Airport by my sister, who was at the time in New York. I never had a government scholarship. At the State University of New York in Brockport, I worked three jobs. I worked for Eastman Kodak Company between the hours of 5 o'clock in the evening to 1 o'clock in the morning as a janitor, working in the dark room. On weekends, on week, weekends I worked as a security guard. At the same time, I was doing 50 or, 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 or 18 semester hours because by the requirement was that to be a full-time student and to be eligible for the tuition waiver as a foreign student, you had to go to school full-time. So I went to school full time, worked three jobs. By May 18, 1974, when I graduated from an undergraduate degree, I almost died from peptic ulcers. But I made it on my own. Not by, this, not by support of the troubles of anybody else in this country. And so when I tell my children, there's, there's benefit in hard work. Your dad came to this place, walked in the snow, and made it. If I can make it, you can. Then my daughter finds in the library something that the Patriot Tower said she supported me and she read me. That's criminal. That's unacceptable. And my daughter just freaked out. Got in the car and drove. Dad, what is this? Anyway. And you know, as she came and I sat her down, I said, Look, uh, this is Liberia. At this time, they've been following me for the last 42 years. So we've got to put it to rest. She says that you have to. Then she got upset again when she saw in the, uh, 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 a, book a book review done by Dr. George K. Kier. The book was written in 1986 by Professor Santo Ognon of the University of, 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 of American University in Washington, D.C. The title of the book is called Africa, the Emerging Continent. George Clay Kier was one of those asked to do the uh, book review. He also published the, the, the garbage. This, this man is supposed to be an intellectual. This man doesn't know me. Grew up ready, probably in fire stone like the rest of mankind. Never even contacted me. He wrote that. Bole, Bole became what he is because he was supported by Tori. He, he, you know, he was a beneficiary of the elitism in Liberia. That's, that's what he spread around the globe. And, and that, that, that's far from the truth. But these things are lying around in archives. So thank you for the opportunity to really dispel these things. But hopefully, wherever TRC takes us, we live long enough to tell our side story in writing. So you'll end up in the archives too. Yes. You know, I went to graduate school. My brother here, I if I say my brother, say, oh, that, that, that your brother, what are you expecting to say? He wanted to school the same way. But my brother had 22 children. 22. But we all earn some form of education. No man believed in educating his children. He never sent any student to live with anybody. I remember as a young man, when he used to come to his bedroom, he learned. People you know, some people take the children send them to this person to live with them, to give them an education. Omen Bole was a proud man. He saw what happened to his brothers. 
They didn't go us through. They were taken away and taught us. I just told you that. And the birds surround the country. He chose to go to school. He had a third grade education, but it served him well. I saw what happened. I am the family historian. And so, gentlemen, I took note of that. In early 2005, Dr. Emmanuel Dolo, residing in the state of Minnesota, contacted me regarding the role of the LPC during the Liberian civil conflict and interestingly to verify whether or not I was ever a ward of the late President Toba. Isn't that interesting? Everybody wants to know who I am, how, how I became what I became. You can't be anything in this country unless, unless you're supported by you know, uh, people other than your, than your family. As, as to interest, what I did, I, 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 you know, I faxed Dr. Dolo a brief description of the LPC and its role during the Liberian conflict. As to interest in my upbringing and the circulation of prevarications in the Liberian community in Minnesota, of my alleged relations to the Torbos, I referred Dr. Dolo to contact Dr. Wilhelmina Torbot Holder, daughter of the late president and wife of Mr. Burley Holder, former minister in the Torbo government, also resident in the state of Minnesota to verify these falsehoods. According to Dr. Dolo, when contacted to verify whether George Bowley was read by the read by the Turbo family, Dr. Wolemina Turbo Holder responded, and I quote, and this is Dolo, he's around. He never lived with us, but I heard my father bought his first pair of shoes. Can you imagine? Mrs. Toro did not read me, but Mrs. Toro bought my first pair of shoes. That's why Dr. Wilhelmina Toro Holder, I mean, this woman is a physician, well educated, medical doctor. But her mother had published that they read me, so they didn't read me now, but they bought my first pair of shoes. So between the time I was on uh, St. Philomena in Zwedro until 1967 I came to race, I, I, what was I wearing? But that, that's neither here or there. Instead, interestingly, three years later, during the TRC hearing in St. Paul, Minnesota, this is 2005 when Willie Minato said that her father bought my first pair of shoes. 2008, June 12, Dr. Toro Holder appeared before your commission in St. Paul, Minnesota. And this is what she said. Bole and Chair Chipo made several visits to soldiers and security men assigned around our residence during our house arrest. According to TRC press release, Dr. Wolemina Toro Holder continued during one of those visits while they were not house arrest after the coup. Mr. Bowler said that Toro sent him to school and provided a scholarship to further his education in the United States. Unquote. Having previously told Dr. Dolo that her father, President Toro, bought my first pair of shoes, the learned physician recalls three years later that I told her and her sisters while on the house arrest after the coup that her father, the late president, Tobert, sent me to school and provided a scholarship to further my education in the United States. Mr. Chairman, members of the TLC, fellow librarians, this, this may seem, seem irrelevant, but I submit that the shifting mentality of Dr. Wilhelmina Will Holder on this issue and probably many other issues suggests some form of mental impairment or moral decadence evidence by Dr. Toba Hoda's shameless lies circulated by this TRC. Finally, and let me for the record, I never, I repeat, I never alone or with former Justice Minister Chechipo at any time visited the residence of the Toba daughters while under house arrest after the coup, let alone provide the information attributed to me. The 
only daughter of the, of the late president known to me is Mrs. Christian Talbot Norman, whom, by the way, is a very pleasant and affable person. It is important to put these lies to rest because they speak volumes of the inebriated and warped mentality of this self styled elitist class of Liberians accustomed to treating others with contempt and indignation. For more than four decades, as I said, these lies have been bad. These lies about me have circulated uncorrected. There comes a time when these liars, gossipers, and petty criminals need to be exposed. Now for me is that time. I publicly challenge anyone and, and all to, re, to rebut not only my version of these events, but produce any evidence to the contrary. The gathering storms. September 1978, I returned to Liberia from abroad and joined the Ministry of Education, having earned a terminal degree in education. This was also a period of interesting political development in Liberia, a period when activism for socio political change in Liberia, the period when the Progressive Alliance of Liberia, PAL, PAL Movement for Justice in Africa, MOJA, and other independent minor socio-political activists challenged the status quo in Liberia. Never a follower, I maintained my independence while freely exercising my right to openly associate with members of various political groups within Liberia, including members of MOJA, PAL, and individuals of varying political orientation. On March, on Monday, March 10, 1980, 11 months after the April 14, 1979 rights riots, I was arrested along with several hundred other others believed to be members of PAL, supposedly for attending a meeting of the Progressive Alliance of Liberia. I was the only government official arrested. Assistant Minister. Though other officials also attended a meeting with, uh, with for PAL Chairman Gabriel Bacchus Matthew, amongst them Senator William V. Stedman Jr. of Maryland County and son in law of President William R. Turbot Jr., I was the only government official, to my knowledge, arrested for attending a PAL meeting. My younger brother, Duesia Urabole, at the time, a student at Cathedral High School in Monrovia was also arrested and detained for no apparent reason other than he was my brother. Oh, he is my brother, still is. <clears throat> I was detained <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> at the Lutheran Post Target at the Barclay Training Center BDC in central Monrovia with hundreds of young men arrested throughout the country. We, never regular, we were regularly tortured and flogged under the supervision of Major Spanton Kipper, commandant of the post Arcade. I might add that while incarcerated, neither Mrs. Tober, neither Mrs. Victoria Tober, nor any member of the Tober clan paid me a visit while in prison. What a way to treat someone you are read and educated. There were rumors of planned executions of select members of PAL when on April 12, 1980, the government of President Trevor was dethroned. We will later learn by non-commissioned officers, by non-commissioned members of the armed forces of Liberia, instituting the government-style People's Redemption Council, PRC. In that government, the PRC that is, I held various portfolios namely ministers of state post and telecommunications and education following general and presidential elections of 1985 i was reappointed minister of state the impending thunder the vi ethnic group <coughs> in liberia has a parable that says quote lightning foretells the sound of thunder from my experience over the years, I was more 
<coughs> excuse me. I saw more than a few flashes of lightning suggesting the impending thunder. As a student activist during the family trial in 1968 to the rise riot of 1979. When in 1986, disagreement over national policy direction became ir irreconcilable between elements of the leadership of the government, example, the leadership of the legislature, not necessarily President Doe and me. I was reappointed Minister of Post and Telecommunications. I did the honorable thing. I resigned from the government. That was